hi guys welcome back to my channel obs and guide made easy in today's video we're going to discuss post date and post-term pregnancy post-term pregnancy is also known as post maturity post date is any pregnancy which has passed the expected date of delivery and post-term pregnancy is a pregnancy continuing beyond two weeks of the expected date of delivery which is more than 294 days from the last menstrual period the incidence is about 4 to 14 percent the average being 10 percent so as long as the mechanism in initiation of labor remains unknown, the cause of post-date also remains unknown, but certain factors have been associated with post-date. Some of the factors that contribute to post-dates are wrong dates. This is due to inaccuracy of the last menstrual period. You find that some patients don't remember their last menstrual period. It can also be hereditary. It's in, in the family. Maternal factors that contribute to post-dates are premiparity. This is the next common cause of post-dates. A previous prolonged pregnancy, sedentary habits, couch potato or little to no activity, elderly multiparous women. The fetal factors that contribute to wrong dates are congenital anomalies like anencephaly. This is because there's an abnormal fetal hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and adrenal hypoplasia which results in reduced fetal cortisol response to trigger initiation of labor. Placental factors include sulfates deficiency, which results in low estrogen. And remember that estrogen is important in the initiation of labor as it upregulates oxytocin receptors in the uterus. How do you make a diagnosis of post -dates? Remember that to determine the fetal gestation age, we use last menstrual period, an early ultrasound scan, most uh, specific scan should be done in the first trimester, and also timing of intercourse. You can relate to the last menstrual period and to the time the patient had intercourse, and also in a clinical examination, height of fundus. So to make a diagnosis of post-term pregnancy, gather a good menstrual history. If the patient is sure about her dates and she had previous history of regular cycles, then you can use the last menstrual period. But you find in some cases, you find that the patient was on family planning and they were not having their menstrual period. And also they were in the phase of lactation or amenorrhea. This can be confusing. In this case, use a first trimester ultrasound scan. A first trimester ultrasound scan is the most accurate uh, form of determining the fetal gestational age. Some of the clinical findings you find in a post-term pregnancy when you examine the patient, uh, you find that the weight of the patient remains the same or reduces compared to the previous weight. And the girth of the abdomen reduces gradually. This is because of reduced amniotic fluid. And you find that the patient had history of forced labor pains, which eventually stopped. And when you do an obstetric palpation, you examine for the height of fundus, the estimated size of the fetus, and you find that there's hardness of skull bones. And you find that the uterus feels full of the fetus. This is because of reduced amniotic fluid. And you, when you do a vaginal examination, you can find hard skull bones through the cervix. So on your obstetric palpation, the height of fundus might seem big and the size of the fetus might seem like it's a big baby. The aim of doing investigations in a post-term pregnancy is to confirm fetal maturity and to detect placental insufficiency. Assessment of fetal maturity includes doing an ultrasound scan and amniocentesis. So remember that the first trimester ultrasound scan is more accurate than the last menstrual period. This is because... Some patients don't remember their last menstrual period and also last menstrual period alone is not a good predictor of ovulation. So in the first trimester, we use the crown ramp length, which is more accurate than using the last menstrual period. The variation that it will give you is plus or minus five days from the true gestation age. In the second trimester, we use the biparietal diameter and the femur length. The variation it will give you is plus or minus 7 to 10 days from the true gestational age.
In the third trimester, we use the bipareto diameter, the head circumference, and the femur length. This will give you a variation of plus or minus two to three weeks. So as you can see, the first trimester ultrasound scan is more accurate because it has less variation of only five days. As you go in the second and third trimester, the variation increases from the true gestational age. Amniocentesis is another way of assessing fetal maturity. This can be done in facilities where you have the equipment. You assess the amniotic fluid, so you look for orange cells. Orange cells are disquamated fetal cells. So if you find more than 50% fetal cells, this indicates that there's fetal pulmonary maturity. And you can also assess for phosphatidylglycerol and lecithin sphingomyelin ratio. We discussed this in PROM that it indicates pulmonary maturity. Lamella body count. Lamella body count is the storage form of surfactant in the amniotic fluid. So if you find more than 30,000 lamella bodies, it indicates pulmonary maturity. Assessment of fetal well-being includes doing a non-stress test done twice weekly, a biophysical profile, and uh, estimation of the amniotic fluid. Other tests you can do are a Doppler ultrasound velocimetry and a contraction stress test. But we're going to talk about these three here. A non-stress test is the continuous electronic monitoring of the fetal heart rate, as well as recording of the fetal movements on a cardiotocograph, which is known as the CTG. So we know that the baseline fetal heart rate should be about 110 to about 160 beats per minute. This is a normal fetal heart rate. So when you do a non-stress test and you find that there's more, two or more accelerations of more than 15 beats per minute, lasting 15 seconds in a 20 minute observation, this is a reassuring non-stress test. This is good. The biophysical profile includes five parameters. The non-stress test we just talked about, the fetal breathing movements, fetal body movements, fetal muscle tone, and assessment of the amniotic fluid. So a reactive non-stress test is the one we just talked about, where you have two or more accelerations of more than 15 beats per minute above the baseline fetal heart rate and should be lasting more than 15 seconds in a 20 minute in a 20 minute observation. So that is called a reactive non-stress test. You score that as two. And if you have fetal breathing movements of more than one episode lasting more than 30 seconds, you can score that as a two. And if you see that there's more than three or three body movements, you score that as two. And if you see that there's more than one active, active extension of the limbs, either it's opening and closing of the hand, you score that as two. And if you have more than one pocket measuring about two centimeters, which is uh, the deepest pool, you score that as two. So the total score of the biophysical profile is 10. Now, if you score eight to 10, this is a normal biophysical profile. But if it's less than eight, this suggests that there's chronic fetal asphyxia and you should deliver the baby. Assessment of the amniotic fluid. The normal amniotic fluid pocket should be about 2 to 8 centimeters. Whilst the amniotic fluid index should be about 5 to 25 centimeters. Okay, so if the amniotic fluid pocket is less than 2, this is severe oligohydraminase. And if the amniotic fluid index is less than 5, that is severe oligohydraminase. So this indicates immediate delivery of the baby. Retrospective diagnosis of postmaturity. This is when the baby is already born. So on appearance, the baby looks thin and odd, and the skin is wrinkled, and there's absence of vernix caseosa. Vernix caseosa is the white film that usually covers the baby. There's greenish yellow staining of the body and cord. This is because of meconium and the head is hard with no evidence of molding. The nails protrude beyond the nail beds and 
The weight is usually more than 3 kgs and the length is approximately 54 centimeters or more. And there could also be evidence of intrauterine growth retardation. It's not all the time that the baby might be big. And the amniotic fluid might be scanty or meconium stained. The placenta, you find that there's aging of the placenta. There could be placental infarcts or calcifications. And when you examine the cord, there will be reduced quantity of Wharton's jelly. Complications of post-term pregnancy. So when a pregnancy overruns the expected date of delivery, you expect the placenta to also expire. Everything has an expiry date. So placental insufficiency occurs because there's placental aging where there's placental infarcts and placental calcification. And if the patient even has complications like preeclampsia or hypertension and diabetes, this even worsens the placenta insufficiency as it worsens the placental infarcts. Antepartum fetal complications of post pregnancy include reduced placental function and oligohydraminase. This in turn results into fetal hypoxia, which results into a fetal distress. And when a fetus is distressed, it tends to poop in the amniotic lycra, which results into meconium stained lycra. During labor, you can have fetal distress. This is because of fetal hypoxia and fetal acidosis, as well as labor dysfunction. The labor dysfunction can be a prolonged labor or a difficult labor because of reduced amniotic fluid and because of the big size of the baby and because of non-molding of the head due to hardening of the skull bones. And there's risk of cord compression because of reduced amniotic fluid and reduced quantity of Wharton's jelly. And there's increased risk of shoulder dystocia because of the big baby. There's also increased incidence of birth trauma. This is because of a big size baby, non-molding of the head due to a hardening of the skull bones. And there's also increased incidence of operative delivery and as well as macrosomia. Postpartum complications of post pregnancy in a fetus include meconium aspiration. Meconium aspiration results into a chemical pneumonitis as well as pulmonary hypertension and atelectasis. Atelectasis is where you have complete or partial collapse of the lung or a section of the lobe. You can also have hypoxia and respiratory failure, hypoglycemia and polycythemia. The polycythemia is a compository mechanism due to the chronic hypoxia. There's also increased chances of NICU admission and increased chances of neonatal convulsions because of the chronic hypoxia and risk of stillbirth. Stern pregnancy does not put the mother at risk. However, there's increased incidence of induction and increased risk of instrumental deliveries and increased risk of operative delivery. Management of post pregnancy. Perinatal morbidity and mortality are increased when the pregnancy continues beyond 41 weeks. So, timely delivery reduces the risk of a stillbirth, and induction of labor may be considered at or beyond 41 weeks of gestation age. Management of uncomplicated post-term pregnancy. You can do conservative management if the pregnancy is between 40 to 41 weeks gestation age and there's adequate amniotic fluid and there's no signs of fetal compromise. What you can do is just help with stripping the membranes and allow for spontaneous labor. You give the patient about 7 to 10 days to go into spontaneous labor. However, if they have not gone into spontaneous labor within that 7 to 10 days, you admit them for induction of labor and you rupture the membranes early in labor to monitor the amniotic fluid. If the pregnancy is already at 42 weeks gestation age, admit for induction of labor. Management of a post-term complicated pregnancy. It's better you plan for an elective caesarean section if the patient is an elderly prime, has preeclampsia or recess incompatibility and there's fetal compromise as well as oligohydraminase. In a case where you are inducing the patient for vaginal delivery and you find that there's meconium stained lycra, it's best you take the patient for a caesarean section. Presence of meconium stained lycra could mean that the fetus has had a hypoxic episode or has been in a chronic hypoxic state. 
So continuing labor would put stress on the fetus, which would result in fetal distress as well as a stillbirth. So cesarean section should be done in facilities where fetal monitoring is poor and pH blood sampling is unavailable to determine fetal acidosis. This is the end of our discussion on post-term pregnancy. In the next video, I'm going to discuss on intrauterine fetal demise. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos. Thank you.